I think we can get started. So thank you so much to everybody for joining this webinar on um, arts, health and empowerment. Uh, it's great to see so many people joining this one. Um, it's our second webinar uh, in the series so far. Um, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today who I will introduce quite shortly. Um, and the topic for today is how can art and art based approaches empower and improve the health and well being of underserved and marginalized populations. So I think before we get started, now that we've got quite a few people um, online, just a reminder to stay on mute uh, when you're not speaking, um, and especially when the speakers are uh, presenting. Um, we are currently recording this webinar, so like I said before, please turn off your video and don't speak if you don't wish to be uh, in that recording. Uh, so I think today the format that we'll follow is to hear from each speaker um, about 15 minutes um, each and then we will um, follow that with um, a discussion, uh, a panel discussion. Um, but as they go, feel free to pop questions in the chat as you think of it too, because we can um, go through all those questions as well um, at the end. And hopefully we'll have about at least half an hour, if not 40 or so minutes um, for discussion after the presentations. And so I think introductions are in order. So my name is Claire, uh, Claire Jung. Um, I'm going to be the chair for this session and I'm a DPhil student currently studying in Oxford Population Health. Um, I'm exploring ethnic in, uh, inequities in infant and pediatric healthcare utilisation in England here. But I also actually work in migration health um, in the Office, in, of, uh, Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, um, which is a relatively new organisation, um, which is why I keep getting the name wrong. Um, I'm also actually a trustee for the charity Art Refuge, and that's an international charity that uh, uses art and art therapy to support the health and well-being of refugees, asylum seekers and other displaced populations. And that brings me to introduce our first speaker for today, who is Bobby Lloyd. So Bobby is the CEO of Art Refuge, and she's a visual artist, a HCPC registered art therapist, a supervisor, a writer, researcher, educator, and among probably many other things. Um, she studied fine art um, at the Ruskin School of Art at the University of Oxford, and she's worked for over many years in the NHS and also in community settings, and also internationally in contexts of conflict and social upheaval alongside her ongoing practice as an artist. She's become increasingly interested in the roles of art and art therapy in relation to displacement, crisis support, co-production, imagination and social justice. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. That's fantastic. Um, I may, I hope I've got this about right in terms of timing but you may need to prompt me maybe five minutes before the end. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I've, I hope this is quite swift. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so the, the theme, uh, yes, I think that was a good enough introduction. That's a great introduction. Thank you, Claire. Um, the theme is art, empowerment and health. And my first um, sort of, idea was to look at what the word empowerment actually means and uh, just a quick definition, the degree of autonomy and self-determination in people and in communities. So just with that, I, the idea of empowerment in mind, I'm just going to introduce the charity. So as Claire says, we use art and art therapy to support the mental health and well-being of people displaced. The charity has its origins in India and Nepal, where we worked with Tibetan asylum seekers in transit. We currently operate in Paris and Calais in France, in Folkestone and Kent, London, Bristol, and we do quite a lot of work online. We use art therapy approaches, crisis support, socially engaged art projects and practice, teaching, training, exhibitions, and research. So I'm going to talk um, about our work on the France-UK border and um, on either side of the English Channel. So I think many of the audience are in the UK, but I'm not sure. So for those who aren't, I'll, I hope this will make sense. But also just to say in the context of this talk, we've had, we've, we've currently faced with the situation of the, U, the war in Ukraine. And I think a lot of what I'm going to say sort of will resonate and, and, and touch um, 
us all in different ways because of the, the, the fact that there are what, 3 million new refugees who have come into Europe over the last month and fleeing out, out of Ukraine following the invasion um, into that country um, by Russia. So with, I'm, I'm sort of bearing that context in mind as I talk about the France-UK border and the refugees who are also concurrently existing in that context. So our work as a charity contributes to crisis support for refugees living in transit and facing ongoing exposure to hostility and homelessness. It supports teams working in this context, delivered by a specialist team of artists and art therapists, including visual artists who themselves have lived experience of displacement. And all of our work takes place in collaboration with other organizations on the ground. Um, you'll see as I go through the slides, images to the, to the left, and I'm not going to talk about them too much, but just to say that they emerge out of our practice in France and in Kent. And this is just briefly here. Um, this is Med saint ambulance, and this is a map that we use. I'm going to come to this later. So the Calais context. In 2015, there was a refugee, the refugee crisis caused a surge in numbers of people seeking asylum in Europe, up to a height of 10,000 on the France-UK border at Calais in 2016. And there are currently around 1,500 people in transit in the Calais area, mostly trying to reach the UK. And mostly, they are young men from North Africa and the Middle East, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan, Kurdistan, Iran and Iraq. Many of them are unaccompanied minors, so under the age of 18. There are no formal camps in the area. There are largely French and British NGOs and volunteers um, supporting those who are gathering there. And psychological spaces are scarce, even though the need has been identified as urgent by our partners, by other agencies, and by refugees themselves. So this is a hostile environment. In Calais, there are fences, the CRS police, that's the riot police, mafia and vigilante violence and intimidation, destruction of property, vulnerability to trafficking and exploitation. And conditions have deteriorated further under COVID-19. There are almost no legal routes to the UK from France. Um, you have to cross the body of water, the English Channel, in order to reach the UK to claim asylum. So uh, people take great risks getting on tr uh, historically trains, then trucks, and most recently getting into small dinghies to cross the channel. Numbers have increased year on year, 2020, 21, 22. And the, the UK government hostile policies, policies towards asylum seekers are, are getting worse, with the Nationality and Borders Bill making its way currently through Parliament and ping-ponging back between the House of Lords and the House, House, of, House, of, Commons, House of Commons. So I'm going to introduce some ideas emerging out of our art refuge work on either side of the English Channel. Your home is not where you come from. Your home is where you feel you are safe. Words by Samir, who was a refugee formerly in Calais, and he's now living in London and working there and runs a project called Hope. Many individuals, such as those fleeing and displaced from their homes, do manage to find meaning in the experiences that have been forced upon them and seem able to adapt to multiple new challenges while at the same time living with huge loss. Others struggle to cope and suffer from a range of trauma responses, including nightmares, depression, and a sense of being overwhelmed by their experiences. And some, a minority, may need specialist treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. And yet others seem to find new meaning for life and renewed energy. So the distress that we witness in, in places like Calais and, and in, in, in Kent is, is often a normal response to a normal situ an abnormal situation. People are amazingly resilient and usually survive difficult circumstances and experiences. People displaced in Calais have taught us that we should not pathologize, that we need to be responsive, not reactive, and to offer tools that we know work. So in Calais, excessive police violence and clearance of makeshift camps takes place on a regular basis. Links are thus severed between people, making the types of psychosocial spaces we offer with our French partners as of particular value. So we use a psychosocial approach. 
such an approach looks at individuals in the context of both psychological factors and their social environment and the impact that both have on their physical and mental wellness and ability to function. Hope and social support play a significant role in people's capacity to cope in adverse circumstances, while focused psychosocial support can itself reduce the severity of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Natural defenses are essential in this work to keep the people we work with safe. An Art Refuge as a charity has adapted psychological first aid, PFA, as a valuable model developed for crisis situations as it helps to build on people's capacity to cope. Our work is trauma-informed and uses grounding tools and techniques adapted to individual contexts. So what does trauma-informed practice mean? We hear it a lot nowadays. It means embracing concepts of safety, of trustworthiness and of transparency. It considers peer support and collaboration. And empowerment is, is key as are giving voice and choice and bearing in mind cultural, historical and gender issues. Protective factors help increase a sense of well-being and assist the individual to bounce back in the face of adversity. Protective factors help to buffer risks and stress and resilience is increased where there is the presence of protective factors. So I've said, um, I've just given some ideas and sort of um, links of, of, of thoughts together really. But the offer of art making might seem low down on this list of essential needs in crisis context. And we think of all the borders surrounding Ukraine. Is, does art making have a role there? Does it have a role in Calais? Does it have a role as people cross the channel? We know that art and image making alongside other art forms, so daydreaming, spirituality, um, sorry, include, as well as daydreaming, spirituality, family, ritual, culture, and community. These are all protective factors which bolster the individual's ability to cope. And we have seen how imagination in our work can for some literally be a matter of survival, such as the ability to imagine something other or the potential for something other than the adverse situation one is in. As art therapists, we, are, we pay particular attention to materials and art media in our work. And we see that these need to link to contemporary culture, to art and art therapy practice. That the materials require a carefully considered response to each particular context, which holds the past, present and future, while acknowledging different lenses and cultural perspectives and being able to recalibrate and adapt. And in the context of a border, we learn from people's use of mobile phones and connectivity. We know that mobile phones and online platforms are actively used by refugees for communication, social connection and survival. They can literally be a lifeline. And in the border context, the mobile phone is often a person's only possession beyond the clothes they are wearing. Okay, and for refugees, sorry. yeah, five minutes. Sorry, Claire. Yes, five minutes. Thank you. For refugees, the functioning mobile phone allows for connection with family and friends, with memories and cultures stored as photographs, with access to practical information, social media groups and maps, with translation tools, with music, video games, sport, football, with the present here and now, with access to routes forward and access to routes home. And in Calais, we've seen that the mobile phone is carried literally as a tool for which people have um, which people have used to navigate their way from their country, maybe in, in Northeast Africa or the Middle East, right the way across Europe and up through France. And we've developed a project with la a large map, which is an ongoing tool, which is taped to different places here on the ambulance. And here we have seen how people can, for the first time, perhaps see their um, the, the uh, land ac across which they've crossed in one go rather than on a mobile phone in, in little snitches and fragments. Um, and we've got many maps where people have drawn their routes. We also use a world map where we often gather around and think imaginatively as well as in a very sort of um, practical way about where people have crossed and where they come from. We've developed a project called the Community Table, which is a conceptual framework and, and physical entity that is evolved out of our work. 
It forms the basis around much of our thinking takes place and grew out of a safe house where we would gather around the dining room table with a group of young refugees and make art together before the evening meal. The community table um, concept is, it, the idea is that everybody is welcome in a, in a day centre space, for example, not just the refugee population, but the director of a service, the interpreters, um, anybody passing through that space, we gather around and make art together. And these are some of the tools we use. We found that ma um, these manual typewriters are an incredibly re um, helpful resource in grounding people and supporting them. The, this is an example of our large community table in Folkestone. Um, you see different uh, materials that are specific to this context. We often have food at the table um, and books and specific um, tools that we have gathered in response to context. We have a project called Smellers Home as we've discovered that different environments call for different things. Um, and here we work with an experimental psychologist called Emanuela Maggioni from the University, University College London and on identifying culturally relevant spices and herbs that connect with memory and, and offer a possibility for, for witness. And then just finally emerging out of the uh, pandemic context, we've developed ongoing work with mobile phones and online platforms to explore the role of online tools for working and engaging with teams and groups of people. And this is one such example, which is on Instagram called Corona Quilt, which is a collective project um, the idea is that daily routines and rituals can help people feel more in control, even at times of chaos and uncertainty, and even particularly at times of chaos and uncertainty. Um, it's an online platform where um, one and a half thousand contributions have been made from 36 countries of people's drawings, um, artworks, textiles and photography that have helped them over the last couple of years. And we finally use social media. Um, it's, we have a cumulative Facebook post over a five-year period of our work in Calais. The posts act as open-ended research to reflect on practice and source material for academic writing. The posts are followed by many refugees using our service, and they feed into other dialogues and collaborations, such as a mental health blog with Refugee Rights Europe, the Border Criminology University of Oxford, 2018. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you that was so a bit of a rapid Bobby. sort of um, run through a whole load of um, ideas. I hope that that made some sense. There's always so much, I think, in the work that you do. And having been connected with Art Refuge for it's been what, nearly two years now, I'm still always so in awe at just the huge array of approaches um, that you use and in you know such an agile and flexible way in these um, contexts of displacement. Um, to the audience, um, please have a think about any questions that you would like to ask Bobby, either in the chat or um, in the panel discussion um, at the end. So thank you so much, Bobby. Um, and now we'll move on uh, to Dr. Sharifa Abdullah, who is a Malawian scholar and participatory arts practitioner, holding a lecturer position with the University of Malawi in the Department of Fine and Performing Arts. So Sharifa holds a PhD from the University of Glasgow, focusing on culture, community arts and health. And through working with Indigenous knowledge systems, Sharifa focuses on exploring the design and development of participatory folk arts for health research and promotion. She's been designing, developing and leading implementation of participatory health related programs with rural communities, including co-founding the Art and Global Health Centre Africa. She's also a founding member of the Malawi Medical Humanities Network. So Sharifa, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I've apparently lost my, my slides, but I will speak to it if that's all right. So generally, as uh, you have introduced me, thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, the title, as has already been said, I won't go into that. So I come from Malawi and I work for the Fine and Performing Arts Department, and we work very much with uh, uh, health related programs using arts, particularly theater, uh, and uh, music and dance and indigenous performances. So generally Malawi consists of 80% of the population is rural and 
because 80% of the population is rural, the HIV uh, prevalence in Malawi is really, really, really high. And that is because sometimes some of the ways in which we communicate with uh, people within the rural communities or that have not probably gone through uh, what we call formal education can be quite limiting. And so we find that the use of art uh, performance and indigenous uh, ways of communication kind of give uh, the communities uh, power to actually make decisions, decide and uh, for better health outcomes, better decisions and so on and so forth. So I won't go into the definitions of what empowerment means because Bobby already described it really, 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 really well. But uh, I will give you a small context of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I have, I think one minute or so and there is, there'll be a video. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, uh, it consists of a 70% of the total number of people living with HIV is within Sub-Saharan Africa. And actually uh, two out of the three estimated uh, 6,000 infections that occur daily are from Sub-Saharan Africa. And Malawi being a country that has got very few people, I would say in comparison, because we are about 18 million at the moment, we constitute 4% of people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that is quite a big number. And 10.6% is our prevalence here in Malawi. And even though the HIV virus has been around for over 35 years, we still have 33,000 new infections uh, on a yearly basis. Because thinking about 2019, let's look at 2019, for example, 33,000 new infections. We, already, we also had 13,000 deaths to this day, you can imagine, related and associated to HIV and AIDS. And at the moment, we have over 1 million people of our 18 million living with HIV and AIDS. And most of this actually is going into the youth and, and, and other vulnerable uh, people. So the reason I will not be making a slide presentation today is that uh, I, we are looking to liberate. One of the ways in which art helps is to actually give a voice, to move away from the colonizing way of pen to paper, or rather uh, typing onto slides and things like that. And we are trying to uh, kind of open that space up to allow for, for, for other languages other than the written to actually speak to us because art is about experiencing, about engaging, about feeling with, feeling together so that we can actually look at the people as people straight in the face, feel together with them. So I will ask uh, uh, that the video be played from that, from that side. And then I will talk about a little bit uh, about it after, if there is still more time. So please do uh, play the video. This is the story of how the rhythm of life in an African village was broken by HIV. It's a story often heard in the privacy of counselling sessions and clinics. But here, it's told in public, with the people who lived the story acting it out to audiences of families, neighbours and chiefs. Most important, this is not just a story for telling's sake. Rather, it's a tale told with a purpose, to mobilise the community against AIDS, and so stop such tales from happening again. This is Credo, the main character in the play, a wife and mother. The play tells her story, she says, because she is indeed a mother bringing up her children in the village. This is Thompson, who plays the part of Credo's husband. After coming in from the fields, he goes off to drink at the house where they sell home-brewed beer and where he hopes to find a woman to sleep with. It's a scene Thompson has played in real life. India, 
Thompson's real work is selling fish from Malawi's Lake Chilwa, bicycling each day to market. He is married, although not really to Credo. He freely admits that just like his part in the play, he's not been very faithful to his wife. This is my story, he says, because in real life I would go out with different women without minding my family. I had no job or work then, but I could get any woman that I wanted. The film weaves the actors telling their real-life stories together with a live performance of the play which they themselves created. One day, Credo gets an HIV test from a health team visiting the village. It comes out positive. Frightened of Thompson's reaction, she doesn't tell him, but rather suggests that they both go and get tested. The appeal provokes an argument. In real life, Credo did test HIV positive and was afraid to tell her husband, who she knew slept with other women. When she suggested they both get tested, he refused. Every time I mentioned HIV, she says, my husband would shout at me. He even claimed that because he was blood group O, he couldn't catch the virus. That's ridiculous, Grado comments. Everyone can catch HIV. In real life, Thompson was also terrified of getting tested, fearing he would become a laughing stock. He tells how he and a group of friends would go off to hide in the reeds whenever a health team came to the village. Thompson was more frightened of the shame and stigma of HIV and how this would change his life than he was of becoming sick with the virus. As the story unfolds, it addresses the most pressing issues of today's war against AIDS. We now have cheap and effective medicines, which can even halt the spread of the virus. But the problem is, how do you get daily treatment to all who need it if people are still so afraid of stigma they don't want to disclose their status to friends and family and may prefer not even to know themselves? In Malawi, a highly successful HIV program provides treatment to more than a million people. Almost 70% of those needing treatment are getting it, most of them in rural health centres close to where they live. Reaching the remaining 30% is today's great challenge, because these are the ones who, for some reason, are afraid to access treatment. As Malawi moves to a test-and-treat policy, the challenge will only become greater. Reaching out to these people is the aim of the story told in the film. As the story continues, Credo confides in her best friend, but soon regrets it as gossip spreads. At the daily trip to the borehole to fetch water, she finds herself snubbed by friends she grew up with. In real life, this scene happened not only to Credo, but also the other women who acted out. Eventually, in the play, Thompson becomes sick. When his relatives find out, they believe he's a victim of witchcraft. This happened in real life to Rose, who plays one of the relatives. She tells how she almost died from HIV because her family took her to the witch doctor instead of the hospital. The story reaches its climax with a fight. Thompson's relatives go off to beat up Credo's grandparents, accusing them of witchcraft. Once again, these accusations really happen to the old lady who plays the grandmother. She says she was accused of being a witch by her own nephews and nieces after her sister became sick with HIV. It hurt a lot, she says, to be accused by my own family. 
The original performance, along with the interviews where the actors tell their stories, has now been turned into a film designed to start a community-wide discussion. The film is being shown to village audiences 1,500 strong. After the fight, the witchcraft dispute ends up in a village court, being heard by local chiefs. As the final image freezes on the screen, the action becomes live. Some of the actors, along with other facilitators, draw in the audience who become the witnesses in the court. What happened? Why was there a fight? Who's to blame? As they trace the dispute back to its roots, it's obvious that the attitudes of the whole village are on trial. Our role as facilitators is to trigger dialogue or discussions within the community from different stakeholders, chiefs, community members, clinic staff and people that are affected by HIV. Having discussed and explored in depth these problems, they now dig for the solutions in order to change be it attitude, behaviours that hinder or bar people from accessing prevention, testing, treatment and care. As the discussion deepens, people from the audience are encouraged to have their say. Why is it that men don't want to get tested? What can be done to make it easier at the health centre and in the village? The discussion becomes most lively when the facilitators start to probe why both men and women sleep with other partners. Afterwards, one of the village chiefs says she's learned a lot she didn't know, for instance, about the stigma and discrimination. They'll be working, she says, to confront these. A counsellor from the health centre says the project will also help their work, making people confident to report problems and building links with the community to reduce barriers to people accessing treatment. The film and discussion are followed by HIV testing, which continues the next day. At performances so far, hundreds of people have tested afterwards, and if found positive, are then linked into local treatment services. But this is not the main long-term medical benefit. The next day, workshops are held to design a community action plan. In this village, they decide to set up a group to liaise more closely with the health centre. The community can help in improving adherence to treatment, supporting those who test positive and patient follow-up. Health workers say that without these kinds of initiatives to extend the reach of rural health services and change attitudes, then treatment programmes can never reach their potential. The problem is people don't necessarily change their social and sexual behaviour because of scientific and medical facts. They change because of social facts on the ground. They change because of how they feel inside themselves and inside their communities. What a better way to connect with people's feelings and dramatize social facts than with a prayer that is rooted in actual stories of real people. That will help Malawians stand shoulder to shoulder and defeat HIV AIDS. One of the best agents for change is to empower the local HIV community. The actors in the play have certainly seen this in their own village as a result of the project. There were men and women in the village on treatment, Credo says, without their spouses knowing. Now they're opening up. Others kept their status secret, fearing they would be laughed at. But because of the play, they're also getting courage. At the end of the discussion, the lights go out once more for the final scene of the film. There's a happy ending. Thompson recovers and makes up with Credo. It's left to Dick Mbalame, who acts as the chief in the play, to sum up. HIV is just a virus, he says. If you get tested early and then take the medicine, you can be fine. Our troubles are not caused by the virus. 
It's the things we do to each other, the gossiping, the laughing and the stigma, which stop people getting tested. They stop people taking their medicines, and in our village, they created all the problems we've just seen. If we can sort these things out, then the story can end happily. Yes, thank you very much. That was the film that uh, I was. I wanted you to journey with me, to listen to, and to experience with me. So I think let me stop there for now. Thank you for listening and watching. <laughs> thank you so much for that, Sharifa. I already have so many questions about how you know you put that play together and how it all works. So hopefully we have time in the discussion to um, talk a bit more about that. Um, I really loved how you know you and also the video they you talked about how arts is a way towards liberation, um, especially for you know such taboo topics like um, HIV. So now moving on, um, I'm now really happy to introduce um, Dr. Felipe Sistón, who is a postdoctoral research associate jointly aff affiliated to the University of Brasilia, and um, oh, I'm not going to pronounce this very well. Um, for, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, FGV, in Brazil. Um, at Brasilia, he, uh, he works for um, Engaja, Engajadamente, an interdisciplinary project in partnership with the University of Oxford that aims to empower adolescents for mental health action through a co-designed chat game tool. And at FGV, he works for Cultural Strategies, which focuses on the relationships between culture and non-territorial mental health in Manguinos in Rio de Janeiro. Dr. Sistern is, in, is interested in citizen science, in mental health, community empowerment and cultural citizenship, especially in the fields of communication, development and human care. And I'm now going to hand over to you, Felipe, to say all of those words again and pronounce them better than I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. It's OK. It's such a responsibility to talk after Bobby and Sharifa. So I really want to start by expressing my gratitude for being among prestigious colleagues to learn from the diversity of initiatives that bring art closer to health and empowerment. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. And let's take a closer look at this beautiful image. Uh, I hope it's OK for you. Everybody is seeing it. Just, uh, okay. Felipe, I have a message on my screen that says enter full screen mode. I think that might be oh. on your screen. I'm not sure, but it's okay. it's blocking some of the, the slide. Okay. Now yeah, okay. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Better. Better now. Thank you, Claire. So, okay, let's go. <clears throat> First, uh, what we are going to see here with me. First, an autobiographical approach, very linked to the second one, an expanded concept of art and mental health. And third, finally, some active projects here in Brazil. And, and I, I will pronounce it. Okay, Claire? <laughs> um, so let's begin. Felipe, uh, I think the yeah. slide that I'm seeing right now is blank, it's white. Mm, okay. I'm not sure why. So let's stop and start again. <laughs> let me do a different path right now. Okay, I will put it here. Just a second. 
No worries, take your time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can see the slide again now. Okay. So let's go. Perfect. Uh, can see okay, that now. It's working. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What you're going to see is my, uh, it's a autobiographical approach of my research. Uh, I, an expanded concept of art and mental health, engaged dementia projects, and other sculptures of change that I, I call it. Um, so let's start, let's proceed through what we don't see. <laughs> what we don't see in this picture. Almost 10 years ago, this place was in ruins. This was the former library of a public school in the outskirts of Niterói, a neighbor city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. There was no graffiti, no budget to maintain it operational, and no political will. What we see now is a place of art and vitality called the Engenho do Mato Library, Bem. But where did the resource to transform it come from? In Portuguese, we have a word for it, mutirão. Collective effort can help us here translating it. Perhaps we don't see only a library in this picture, books and shelves, there's something else. Uh, I think I, I am not appearing for, for you. <laughs> Also, okay. yeah, Felipe, okay. I think it's gone back to. Oh, now it's changed the slide. I think yes. it was on the first slide before, but now I think it's moving yes. again. Yes, I think this concept here dialogues a lot with Sharifa video at the end when the man says, uh, "Social facts change." So here I am. I bring us. Uh, what if we think? Uh, from this artistic concept of social sculpture. Social sculpture is a theory developed by the artist Josef Beuys in the 1970s, based on the concept that everything is art, that every aspect of life could be approached creatively, and as a result, everyone has the potential to be an artist. Here is an, expand, an expanded concept of art, helping us understand how it transforms society. So is culture as thought, as politics, culture, education, social organization? Boys teach us that Engenho do Mato is more than a library. It is a social sculpture, an artistic intervention to create and recreate many things, including a safe place to resist the pressures of the political deficit together. Take a moment to think what a safe place feels like for you. Is it a place where you feel secure, connect, created with others? Is, is there any artistic element, interrelation, protagonists, antagonists? The Engenho do Mato Library, bem, was a place for me, scoop my safe place. Health and art are also part of the life of a PhD student or a scientist. This is something I discovered during my doctorate trajectory. A few months, a few months after receiving my own mental health diagnosis. Yes, uh, the permanent co construction of Engenho do Mato Library is still my way of scoping my safe place. This quote from my colleague, Dr. Eduardo Torri, resonates deeply with me. Being part of such social sculpture helped me break free from stigma itself imputed, redesigning a new social valid role as both a scientist and a producer of culture. Perhaps there is something in a social sculpture 
that stimulates new paths for individual, individuals' autobiographies. Anyone who is a producer of a uh, bank of the library here, for example, is given the chance to expand the library territory into their own workshops or office, sharing servers or goods to support the library continuous cultural expansion. A local song predicted that after the community library, an advanced research center will come. As part of this collective, I worked to make these lyrics a reality. As a citizen researcher, I founded the Bank Plus informal lab, <laughs> my home office from where I speak today. So the library is scripted, uh, changed in my own autobiography path. <laughs> this change took me to other sculptures that I want to present you today. From the, from the informal lab in Jane Matsu, I work with other three projects scooping change, all of which connected, connect culture, art, mental health, and communication. I will start from the one in the middle, the Engajadamente project. Mm. Engajadamente and the other projects that I mentioned here today are grounded on the notion that mental health and well being are linked to values of citizenship and social inclusion. One of the paths my informal lab helped me to experience is this one about producing uh, health by a storytelling chat game. The first journey with two steps, let me present you. Uh, the first one, it's co-produce, not produce, but co-produce the understanding of how adolescents would like to contribute to community well-being and the resource uh, needed to overcome barriers to this participation, mainly in schools. And the second step, a very uh, both artistic and technological one is a script, program, and test, a bot, a chat bot. Here you see an example uh, made, uh, provided by talk to you one of the partners. Uh, in a, a, a chat bot that is going to be tested in several of Brazilian state schools under the guidance of consultant committees of school professionals and Brazilian young people. So that's the co-production taking place. And what do the young people consulted say? We consulted around, uh, we listened around 48 uh, young people from all the five regions of Brazil. Not that small country. <laughs> I like to help, but I don't know how. Caring for yourself to care for others, act to prevent. They do want civic engagement strategies. They see that the potential of young people is underestimated. Young people uh, need a legitimate space where they feel listening to. Art is a form of support engagement. I think everybody here totally agree with that. And mental health is affected by social determinants such as prejudice and discrimination. Okay, so the, the story we are building, the, it reflects what we listen to. We have an immersive storytelling via an automatic chat. Chat as if you were in your school, we invite the, the, the young to chat as if he, he, he is in his school. Uh, there is a group of characters that is programmed to help uh, him through a hero's journey. Example, your best friend is struggling, struggling 
with his mental health? Where is his safe place in the school? Follow the clues to find him and help him. <laughs> so this is the hero journey they, they face. Some objectives, some goals, uh, raise awareness of mental health, promote peer-to-peer -peer support, inspire mental health actions in school. Okay, so this is, here's another journey that uh, that library <laughs> took me in. Uh, in. In this project, it's similar to the journey number one, the before, but it works with more human-to-human -human communication. It's also about a chat, but focus on human-to-human -human communication, utilizing WhatsApp broadcasting leads. Uh, here I am partnering with a local NGO, also uh, not only one, many local NGOs, an academy. So we have more than 1,000 young communicators from slums of the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro, uh, working to tackle misinformation on health and popularize rights, popularize digital content creation techniques, and adaptation to the local style of the uh, networks. So we want also to open dialogue about health and human rights at scale, claim space, voice, and influence, building a safe space for peer support and young people's freedom of speech. And finally, one more journey cultural strategies in favelas. We have a very important health institution in Brazil called Fiocruz, that is one of these uh, logos. And we do want to understand the cultural strategies around, surrounding uh, this building of Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro. We have many favelas, uh, slums around it, one of them is the complex of Manguinhos. And that we want to understand the process of self-organization of communities, health production, production of subjectivities, and emancipation and citizenship. Okay, we, we, we map already more than 30 initiatives from ballet, summer camp, even our English course <laughs> that is mobilizing a lot of people even during the pandemic uh, situation. So we, we produced three lives on YouTube about that. Here is a picture from the New York Times uh, regarding the ballet of Manguinhos. And I quote one of the leaders of the ballet. Uh, she says that culture is taken by force. It's not given. Uh, the, ch the children and young people fight for it. If they need to clean the stage, for instance, to have it, they will do that. Okay. Okay, journey number one, two, three. Do we have a common social sculpture, social facts, as uh, the video of Sharif said? Yeah. Yes, I think young people and cultural communities could change. When, when they are multiplying vital safe space within their territories, libraries, schools, lands, going beyond the disease-oriented space, such as clinics and hospital, art is a stage for human connection, support, and citizenship. Here is a picture that, for me, uh, make it, it all those words in one image. It's a street carnival in Rio de Janeiro. And we see people inside and outside the old hospice, hospice, hospice which in 2021 announced the end of institutionalization after 110 years of operation. OK. My hat my references and thank you. Here's my contact and my partners. <laughs> thank you so much, Felipe. I think you brought up 
quite a number of things that I just really hadn't considered um, before, you know, like, for example, what you said about arts and technology and how to sort of reach people through different avenues as well, like, like gaming and, and storytelling. Um, so I think now that everybody has presented, um, we can open up um, the floor to anybody in the audience who would like to ask questions of any of our three speakers. And of course, thank you all again so much for your presentations, um, giving us so much food for thought. Um, if you don't feel comfortable speaking up um, as well, feel free to post questions in the chat and we can um, moderate that chat box as well. Would anybody like to start us off? It's always the first bit where you have to pick on people. Hi. <laughs> oh, um, great. So I just have a very generic, generic question, uh, which is how do you overcome language boundaries um, when you don't have translators um, locally, potentially? Um, so how do you, have you got experience in um, getting a group of people together um, um, to do some sort of artistic activity without knowing their language? This is probably a question that's relevant to all of our speakers. Who should we start? I think I've got Bobby at the top of my that's screen. Right. <laughs> Would you like to begin? Happy to start. Um, well, we work with um, people around our tables who, who have a number of different languages. And seven years on, we've never really had a sense that there's a deficit because the arts carry so much of what takes place. We, I mean, in, in Northern France and in Kent, there's often interpreters we can access, um, but also there are people around the tables who are willing and, and happy to share and, and to engage each other in, in, in supporting each other. And that's part of the philosophy of, of the way we work. Um, and when we have an, uh, uh, you know, we speak English, um, people trying to reach the UK want to practice English. So we have an advantage, uh, uh, you know, and a, a sort of disadvantage in that, um, actually somebody yesterday was working with a group yesterday, pointed out that you British people are really lazy. You don't have to learn any other language. You've colonized the whole world and so on and so forth. <laughs> you know. um, but I think the art carries, uh, carries the work that needs to take place around the tables. Um, and we learn so much and we bring in, we've got a book that's got 94 languages from an area in East London, Hackney. Um, it's a poetry book and each poem is translated from the original into English so that there's a, a comparison. We use resources like that. Um, that's just a simplistic answer. I'm going to hand over to Sharifa and Philippe. I'm sure you've got more sophisticated <laughs> responses. Uh, yes, I think you are, you are right. And as for my kind of work, I've mainly worked within the Malawian context and very familiar with the Malawian language. However, as we are talking about the work of art, it's something that is expressive and people express sometimes their innermost feelings and desires that when you, we are working with, uh, for health promotion, for example, it's easier to just let those expressions come out and be able to communicate or connect through the work of art. But now it, I found it slightly more difficult when it comes to looking at the artwork as a research method, for example, to try to understand the experiences and the life of somebody else that you're going to represent or talk about. It becomes more difficult because then, let's say, for example, there's an image there. Philippe talked about what we saw in that image. What we see in it differed. I'm sure it's different because for me it was different as well, based on my own points of reference, my own experiences, my own feelings at this very moment, and maybe others in the past that that image or some of the colors may have evoked. So I think the issue of translation is a critical one and not just in terms of actual language like English, Chichewa, French, but also the translation of understanding of how do we take a work of art and actually present it in academia, for example, how do we represent that those feelings? So that kind of translation is also can also be quite problematic because we can impose our feelings and understanding 
on someone else's expression and feelings and understanding and therefore dishonor that. In terms of actual language, I think it is important to work with a translator. I've watched, uh, 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 for instance, when we were making the film, my colleague Tom Gibb uh, spoke only English and I also helped in terms of what he needed to capture and how uh, some of the artistic work happened and I was able to translate that. So I think it's really important when you are working to be able to communicate with, with others through uh, translations and with people who actually understand what that work is about, what the art is about, and not just anybody who can speak the language. Thank you. Yeah, I, we don't face here in, in any of those projects that I said, uh, a very challenging situation regarding translation. But I need to say something about that. Also, I think together with Sharifa, that we have co-production, we, uh, we have many different people trying to, to make a research, trying to make a library, uh, to, uh, to make decisions together. So how, for, how, we, how do we translate or create a new language within <laughs> this, uh, those groups? <laughs> this is a, a, really, a, a real challenge and uh, not easy, but uh, misunderstanding sometimes is not only uh, uh, something that you are not listening, it's a kind of participation. If you, if you pick from there and this, uh, to look some misunderstanding as, um, as, a, as a possible way, a possible path for a, the, the, the need of the creation of a new language within that people in in the co-production co uh, or in the autogestão, the mutirão, as I said in Portuguese, the quality before. How do we make it possible? We need to communicate. We need to understand different uh, desires and and ways of putting things together. So. Thank you very much. That was already interesting, and I love the ideas of uh, art as an as a separate language that that we can all share as well. Mm. Thank you, Anne, for the question, and thank you so much for your responses, um, all the speakers. Um, we have quite a few questions now popping up in chat, so I'll go through um, as they appear. So we've got a question for Sharifa um, from Isa or I Isa. Um, about how the play um, was developed in terms of who wrote the scenes, um, about uh, uh, was it a collective effort between the actors and facilitators, and was it difficult to bring communities together to produce or to share the play? Uh, shall I respond? Please. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about that. So generally, it was co-produced. So as you can see that we went into a community without anything, with just the idea of we need to work with people to understand, to share their experiences of HIV and AIDS, to identify what are some of the barriers that, given the statistics that I had shared, the data that I had shared, what are some of the barriers that stop people from actually accessing uh, uh, prevention, treatment and care, HIV related services, because we have clinics uh, within communities, but somehow it's becomes difficult for people to actually access. And the question was, why? And so uh, these participants were selected through uh, traditional selection systems by uh, chiefs and other stakeholders within the community. We, are, we asked if we could have about 20 people to work with. And when we were introduced to them, together we started from building relationships and building trust, just playfulness. And from there, it was a 12 day process to actually come to the point of where we have actually have the, the, the performance. So the performance itself was developed from the stories. If you saw the way the film was positioned, it talked about this is my story because as a mother, I am this, 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 this. So the individual participant stories came together to create another reality, which was the play now, that was what was created. But each segment of that play belonged to, were stories about 
different individuals, different people, different experiences within the community. So it was collectively developed. And my job was generally to my, myself and uh, a colleague, Maria, was generally to facilitate that process to help to see where we can respond and how we might support. Because my work deals with participatory art production. So that performance was not written, actually. There is no place where you're going to find scenes written. We are an oral culture. And so we worked through our oral nature to tell the stories of our communities and of our people. So yes, it was collaboratively produced mainly from the stories and experiences of the rural people and the people that you have met and encountered through the video. That's fantastic. Thank you, Sharifa. I see Tom's hand is up. Now, is this the same Tom that helped you on this project? It is indeed. <laughs> Welcome, oh, Tom. I, Come in. What were you about to yeah, say? I, I was just going to say that um, Sharifa's um, uh, 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 the, the, the importance of her role as a facilitator in doing that, and she's very modest, and, uh, and uh, I think it's incredibly important. If you go into a village in Malawi and you start looking for stories of HIV and for people to tell you what... Um, what should be in public health campaigns about it, et cetera, you'll very often get the same messages that have been put in health campaigns, which are, are often quite negative um, and uh, uh, um, actually can sometimes reinforce the stigma. So having a facilitator in there who can work through it, help people work through what they think about it, et cetera, et cetera, is incredibly important. And her role in, in doing that, I think, is, it was really key. We did a similar project in, in Zimbabwe. And again, um, I was working with local um, Zimbabwe filmmaker and them going in and researchers and them going in and, uh, and taking uh, and really doing a big research research project almost in the communities beforehand was absolutely key. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Um, we've got a few more questions as well in the chat, and I think a couple of them are uh, similar in. So Claire Clark, and did you want to come in and speak um, and ask your question? Oh, I can read it out. Sure. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I just wondered um, in terms of thinking about, so I've done quite a lot of outreach, but it's been within this country, within schools um, and that kind of environment. And I'm just wondering a little bit about the practicalities of setting up these sort of art projects in the kind of um, environment of sort of refugee camps. Um, and I was wondering what, what works well in terms of the arts there and you know, in terms of the, the projects that you run, what, what gives you the most impact um, within a group of people that are there? I just wondered if you could share your experiences on that and yeah, what, what works well and, and what, what didn't work well? Should, should, should I go given that I'm working in the <laughs> sort of refugee context? Um, thanks for the Question, Claire. Uh, I mean, I think we've worked, we've discovered that over the time of working um, in particularly on on our very specific um, context, which is which is the the, the UK France UK border, that that the materials that work best are, are um, temporary in nature. Um, they are they can they're easy transportable, reusable, and can be captured with the mobile phone, for example. So we've, worked, we've discovered that um, we can use large mats which then fold back up and then just go into the back of the car. We also use plasticine, um, which is brilliant for de-stressing, supporting people to de-stress. So we might hand a piece of, offer plasticine around a group. Everyone will take a, a ball of plasticine and then the most amazing creatures might um, emerge out of that process. We also use miniature bricks. I don't know, can I just quickly share my screen again? Because I didn't really do justice to, is that okay, Claire? Other Claire? <laughs> yes, definitely, go for it. Um, so th this, this is just an example of the plasticine. Um, these uh, objects were made at the very last day of the jungle camp before it was dismantled. Um, young, one young man making an airplane, he wanted to reach the UK. Um, and another young man from Sudan making the camel and, and himself 
anticipating the next stage of the journey. This was a boat made by somebody who just crossed the English Channel maybe two or three weeks earlier and wanted to represent his boat. So they're, they're very small, transportable objects. Um, and then just quickly, kites. We had a whole project about kite flying. So again, things that can be quickly assembled and, and easily put away. Um, and then uh, the maps. And just, I just want to show you one material which is really key. I'll just quickly put this on. Um, sorry. So we use, we've discovered that small building bricks um, are incredibly helpful in the context of our work. And here are two men, young men in their teens from, uh, I believe from Afghanistan, who were sleeping outside um, and probably going to try and get onto the, into a truck that night. And here they are playing together. So we've discovered ways or tools that can sort of offer opportunities for, we've heard this word co-production, for coming together around these tables. Um, and and uh, yeah, for a moment, becoming absorbed in something, becoming distracted and engaging with play, which actually we've discovered is, is really, really helpful on the board, in the border context. Just being able to play and process and work something through, through the materials, even if it's for 10, 15 minutes, can support people in feeling more replenished. That's lovely, thank you so much. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks, Claire, for the question. Um, so I see we've got a couple more. Now I'm just going to scroll down to, so Claire Miles, I think, had a similar question. Um, lots of Claire's here today. Um, but Claire also asked of Sharifa and Felipe as well about the types of materials and art forms that uh, you commonly use um, in your work. Did you want to quickly speak to that, Felipe and Sharifa, before we move on? I think Ben's got a question and then Raphael. Let me, let, me, let me try to respond to that. Uh, I think in my context where I, I'm not sure about refugee settings, I would not be able to speak very clearly about that, but I would think the principle could be the same. But one of the things that we work with, if you saw the video, the theater did not have any settings as in chairs, any props, it had nothing. We were working with our, the actors' bodies, we were working with community resources, what there was available. So the initial identification of, uh, uh, what kind of uh, artwork to work with was actually based on what do we have. So operating from a medium of where the ways of communication already belong to the communities, because sometimes it is possible that the artwork itself becomes the imposition and the hindrance of the participation of the people that you'd like to participate. For example, we've met people in rural communities where drawing and painting works best in workshop settings with people who have been to formal education systems. But within the community, we, find, we found that they are a performative culture and so are most uh, cultures within the African continent. And so in terms of formative culture, what are the cultural resources? So we look at their folk mediums, the mediums that they already use to communicate, to share the values, beliefs, and so on and so forth. And when we identify that together with the, that team, that is when actually we understand that, okay, let's work within how we already communicate with our already existing languages to make it easier for, for, for participants to express, but also inexpensive. So much so that even if we move away, you'll find that those, uh, th that those communities and those uh, people who had come together through that performance have continued to interact and to sing together, to share together. And so it becomes uh, like the identification of the art form depends on the actual group of people you're working with and what they feel is best capable of expressing, uh, for them to express what they need to express. So that is my contribution, thank you. Uh, I want to say a bit about that too. And yes, the, the easiest one for participation, I think it's, that's a good uh, point. We, we have with the young communicators, um, a, a theater uh, experience that we, we experience like in this, situation in this scenario of zoom <laughs> uh, so you you sometimes you have i don't know a uh, toilet paper <laughs> in the scene you you have what they have at home at home sometimes it's just to to appear or disappear from the scene 
from this this uh, small box. So in in the library we do have we we did once um, uh, or a, a play not a play but a painting uh, workshop with a person that is living with ex schizophrenia. He was the teacher. <laughs> that was one of the best case uh, in which we could bring uh, to the scene uh, the, the youngest people who were uh, going to the trafficking, going to the, 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 the drug dealers. So for the first time when we had, when we had this person with these uh, painting together with his abilities or disabilities or uh, uh, illness, uh, making a art of it, this was the most attractive for those uh, young people around uh, the life. Thank you so much for that, Felipe, and also Sharifa. I think this common thread uh, coming through working with um, the populations that you do a lot of the time, it's working with what you have um, and what's most effective. Um, so I think uh, other questions. So I think, Ben, did you want to come in with your question and then Raphael after that? And I think we're close to closing. So let's go with those two. Yeah, happy to. Um, again, thank you so much, everyone. This has been really, really inspiring. Um, I have a quick question about evaluation because um, there's some really incredible themes coming through around joy, around safety, and that hope um, and courage uh, in all sort of the, the three sort of projects you've been talking about. Um, and I was wondering, sort of, how how in these projects, what kind of approaches have you taken to to evaluate? Or, or reflect on um, these particular sort of really quite <laughs> difficult concepts to sort of uh, to measure basically. I wonder if you've got an approach you've taken to sort of measure some of these really underpinning things that, that help us understand well-being really and how art can affect well-being. Okay, maybe I can uh, have a small talk about that. Uh, I, I the younger communicators, uh, we do want, we do work with WhatsApp and WhatsApp broadcasting lists. Uh, I, I don't know if everybody here is, is uh, aware of it, of it, but uh, at the beginning, it's a three or four months uh, project uh, time in total for a group of you. Uh, so at the very after the second uh, week. We we really for for the, the people of uh, networks of the youth with us a uh, few questions about regarding uh, fake news uh, regarding misinformation regarding some of the uh, healthcare social social care so after the the, the last week we asked again those same questions. So that was uh, a way to enhance this uh, evaluation. We're still uh, working on that, but I think it was an important move just to give one example. Yes, let me perhaps try to share the way we work to evaluate, to understand impact or uh, the outcomes. So generally, I think the, the first and fundamental impact or outcome of the work, it's the work itself and what it does to the people that we are working with. And sometimes the way we measure, we, we have been struggling in this case to say, how do we actually capture the in full impact of this kind of work? And so far, to be honest, I haven't quite found it yet. I'm still looking at uh, thinking about how even the dialogue itself created how do we measure that? How can we be able to speak to other people in other disciplines in, in, in health research, social scientists, to be able to say that our methods indeed are this, that, and that. But the, quest, the other question is, do we really have to account for this kind of work that is held so personal to, to the experiences of people, the deep uh, experiences? Do they have to be measured and accounted into numbers? Well, that's a question for a different, uh, what do you call it, webinar. 
But for now, in this, uh, in this work, because our partnership was also with Dignitas International, and that was a health, uh, they provided health, uh, part of their work was providing uh, health services, and they were the ones coming in to also support the testing during the film screenings. So generally, we did a qualitative and quantitative data, data was collected. Qualitative data was collected through semi-structured interviews with six attendees of each of the screenings, in this case, for example. And also they looked at how, what the discussions produced, what were the community action plans that were created that came from uh, uh, the performances and how two months later, how was the implementation of the community action plan by the communities going on? And we found that almost all the community action plans had been put in place and the community action plans were meant to come and address the barriers that make people not to access prevention, treatment, care, or HIV related services. And so the communities were the ones creating these community action plans. And so part of our assessment is to see, to speak to the, uh, to the participants themselves, to share their story, to share how they felt, what these processes did for them, whether they were, how they empowered them, given Bobby's definition of what empowerment looked like. And so we also did qualitative and quantitative. So through these performances, we found out that actually it subverted for instance, the, the, the figures in terms of Ministry of Health here, we found that men were very unlikely to go for testing. And the, the figures, I have slides here, which because of time I wasn't able to show, but because of uh, men hardly ever went for testing. They were very, very low, but women were constantly going for testing. And that became a group of people, that was a, a group of concern. Even in our data, it shows, in the country data, it shows that way. But through these screenings and offering moonlight uh, uh, testing, we found that actually we had even more men, 57% of the people who tested were men. And through these screenings and performances, over 1.4, around 1.4, uh, thousand people tested, uh, which around 60, 60 of those had been testing for the very first time. And also chatting with people like that, we were able to see what are some of the other deeply held issues that were not that, that they were not talking about. And so there, there's a quote by one of the participants, one of the chiefs saying that after the screenings, you'd find actually people grouped in little groups discussing the issues that even after we had left with the film, discussing those issues and looking at ways to, to actually improve uh, their health be related behaviors. Some of it put some attitudes at rest. Some of it shifted uh, knowledge what they knew about HIV and AIDS. Some of it shifted the attitudes and some of it actually shifted the practices. It, it had different effects on different people. So in this case, we, we had a whole uh, evaluation process to look at the impact and it has had uh, so far, I would say really, really, really great impact. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sharifa. Is there anything that you would like to add, Bobby, before we move on to the next question? Just very briefly, I mean, we're not, um, our work isn't attached to an institution as such, though a member of our team is doing an educational doctorate on the work in Calais. I think we use an action, I would say an action research sort of model. We, wa we watch very carefully as to how people are making use of our tools and materials and tables, and we adapt in an ongoing way, um, even to the point of really looking as to whether plastic works better than than wood in terms of the sort of building blocks that we use. So it's sort of quite nuanced, the work and very particular. Um, but we, um, I think we, we, yeah, I think, uh, and we are also involved with other pieces of research around the edges of the project, um, formal, more formal pieces of research. Um, but I think over seven years, we've developed the methodology of working largely based on the sort of discussions, engaging in, communication research um, in, in a sort of light touch way, um, writing academic articles, getting feedback, and hearing what the people around the tables have to say to us about their experiences. I hope that says something to the, to the discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Bobby. And so now I think, Raphael, you were next, and then we'll move on to Beth and then close, I think, for today. So my question is actually really similar to Beth's one. Uh, I would really like to know if both your projects, Bobby's and 
um, sorry, in Sharifas, if you had any government, any systematic government support uh, or opposition in, in, in what level? And how does that affect the scope and sustainability of your work? Uh, for example, in Brazil, we had, when we deal with HIV, with the unified health system designing really, effect, really effective uh, public policies to fight against uh, the HIV. Uh, nationally, they supported soap operas that uh, talked about it. And, and in lower levels, like cities and municipalities, they supported groups and NGOs that made place uh, in schools to talk about HIV. So because of that, when Brazil fought against HIV in the 1990s, we were really successful. successful. So I really wanted to know uh, in what level both of you had institutional support from your government to uh, spread awareness and treat the problems you were dealing with. Uh, just briefly, we don't have any government support. In fact, we're working in a very <laughs> complex environment where the government is actually hostile to the sort of context that, that we work in. Um, too much to say there. Um, we actually depend largely on um, donations and small trust to enable us to do our work. So in that sense, it's sort of a more, it has more of a sort of activist feel around it. Um, that's not to say that we don't take our um, sort of engagement with issues and responsibilities and concerns very seriously, but it's not, we are actually able to be more flexible and responsive to what we find um, as a result of the sorts of funding that we sort of seek out. Yes, it's, 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 it's the same here. We had, we did have a partnership with Ministry of Health, if you saw on the video as well, but the partnership was not exactly in terms of funding because the funding for this project, uh, the initial theater performances came through OSISA, Open Society of Southern Africa. Sorry, I, I, it gets me all muddled up, but OSISA is the one that initially funded it. And then for the making of the film, I think Tom would, would speak better to that. And we worked in partnership with, with Dignitas as well as Atangobo Health Center Africa. So during this time, it was the resources that came from this funding space that allowed us to do the work. But because we are working in communities, we cannot enter communities without the Ministry of Health's approval. So in that case, they, we had their support. And because we're working with health centers that after this engagement, art engagement, people would be tested. We would work with also with people from the health centers, which are government sponsored. And so they would contribute some of those things. But one of the major challenges that, that we, we met was that sometimes the test kits were not there. So people would want to test during the moonlight testing, but because there's not enough test kits or because our staff in the, in the health centers are quite limited, we, were, we didn't quite have enough staff to cater for all the demand that was required there. But yes, in terms of support, it's different. It's not just monetary support. There were other ways, uh, in-kind supports from the Malawian government and Tom, as well, as I said earlier, would be able to speak to uh, the support that was rendered through for the making of the actual film. Yeah, I, um, so <clears throat> the, the, the actual film was funded, it was made on a shoestring. Um, we didn't really get any outside proper support. Um, I got some donations and, and we did it with very small amount of money. And I, I think I, I lived in Malawi for three years I also lived in Brazil for six years at the time you're speaking of when, when the whole campaign against HIV, I was a journalist working there and I did a lot of reporting on that. And I think that the, the sort of level of government campaign in schools and stuff in Brazil is something that the rest of the world would have been, would have been great if it could have emulated. <laughs> the kind of things that were being done in schools in Brazil um, were, were, were very, 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 um, in front of its time um, and uh, uh, certainly I mean we've made some other films uh, about 
people growing up with HIV in Africa. And, and, and a big part of the problem is that what they learn in school and then what they find out afterwards are two completely different things. And uh, adolescents trying to get their heads around that when, when you know, they've been told in school that it's terrible and, and you'll die from it. And, uh, and when you go to, uh, when they find out they've got it, that it's completely the opposite story. Um, I, I think those kinds of things really um, could be addressed you know, with a Brazilian type going into schools and and um, in this country, in the UK, I've gone in and talked about HIV in some secondary schools and showed some of the films. And um, it, it it is now at last changing, but it's only in the last two or three years that it's moved away from a message of fear towards one of actually this is a normal health condition. You can ma it, it, it's a manageable health condition. People live with it you know perfectly fine they can have a family they can live as long as everyone else and that's the key to actually getting on top of the epidemic so it, it is changing here but i think it's still got it's very patchy in africa thank you so much for that tom um it's nice to see the connectedness now between <laughs> all of the, the the different areas that have been mentioned today um i'm conscious that we're already over our allotted time but I see there's still quite a number of people online and I think Beth you had one more question so I'm not sure if the speakers need to dash off anytime soon or if we can answer your final question and then wrap up that be okay with I, I can be here for another 10 minutes that's fine okay Beth over well, to you thank you so much everyone um for your presentations are really um yeah, really inspiring and a lot of food for, food for thought. Um, I work in a welcome funded um, research institute and um, I think really uh, as an extension to what Raphael was um, uh, speaking about, I was just really interested where you find sort of um, institutions and, and research, in, um, research spaces can be helpful or a hindrance when connecting with communities because there's um, a real appetite to support communities um, and actually start with communities um, when we're engaging. Um, but I, I think sometimes it can, just the mere fact you're coming from an institution can really create barriers and problems there. Um, so I was just really interested in panels, um, uh, sort of, yeah, views on, barriers and and, and, and and ways of yeah, facilitating things that, that, that institutions can really actually help with. Okay, let me try with some examples. Um, young communicators, they do have local partners and we have many favelas, so we don't know, we cannot know everything about the reality of each home. And so we do work with partners, even more local partners. And once we heard that uh, it's, it's, it's not good for me, local partner, say, <laughs> to have UNICEF logo here uh, because it, it will vanish my logo <laughs> in terms of it's a big player, international player. And how uh, can I? Uh, so okay, uh, so we do we did uh, create a new logo for the young communicators, so they do have the, the logo, and we don't need uh, UNICEF or other logos. Uh, the UNICEF or even the local partner, it's okay. So to make it stronger, and uh, we, what is the, the most important? Uh, okay, this is a the case there was another one and okay but the library the library has no governmental support uh, it's just the civil society the community but surround surrounding the the library uh, we are going to come to to celebrate 10 years of library community <laughs> uh hold but surrounding area it's like 20 years of still ruins we still have a, a school in front just in front of it uh, in ruins so it's hard this the, the government 
uh, partnership. It takes decades to, to, to be real established. Yes, so thank you very much for that, Philippe. I think one of the fundamental challenges that I've come across, even with my PhD research from literature as well, has been the issue of the inability of large institutions to listen. You know, so we are working within the arts sector and we are dealing with real people's stories here, but what mostly our impact is judged on is numbers. So how many people this is, how do you judge the story and experience of a person by putting numbers to it? So it's like we, our work in the arts is being measured by, let's say, for example, a fish's ability to climb a tree. You understand what I mean? We are not doing the same thing to this body, to this individual. So in my, in my culture, we believe the human being doesn't just exist as a biological entity. They exist as a spiritual one. They exist as, 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 as a cultural body. They exist in multiple dimensions. And now, while you can measure the ability of a, a plasmodium or, or, or whatever virus to move around the body, it is not possible to measure the relationships that have been built and, and the mental space and capacities and empowerment. Even right now, empowerment really, the measurement of empowerment is quite tricky. You can only try to demonstrate that empowerment has, has, has happened. So I think one of the fundamental issues that we've had is because of this, we face a lot of impositions from uh, our funders because they have, and understandably so, they have the money and they want certain things to come out. But now when it comes to be applied in our context, those things, some of them end up not mattering to the people or, or, or that we are working with. But because we know we need to write a report that states, I'm, I'm just giving an example here, that states that so much, so much, we become the tools of imposition on the people communities that we are working with. So I think one of the things that would be really, 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 really important would be to try and step back from the quick fix, the traditional, the, 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 the common that we have been doing in the past. If we're expecting to see different results, we need to step to start something different. So one of the major things that I'm looking would be important to look at would be how do we evaluate these at Works. We can't evaluate them on the same basis of uh, social science based research, we can't evaluate them on the same basis as uh, biomedical research, because they are not biomedical, they're not social sciences, that's what we are, why we are who we are. So we, I think that's one of the questions that have been really lingering in my mind, and perhaps my next step would be to look for partnerships that will be able to explore how we might actually, if measurement is such an important thing, how might we actually be able to measure because I feel like even though our, 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 our performances, our artwork can produce lions from, from something, but you're taking that lion and say, go underwater and sustainability will be measured on how long you can stay underwater. I mean, that's being put to fail, <laughs> being set up to actually fail. So I think one of the biggest challenges is the impositions that come from big funding agencies, so much so that the small fish uh, that are not applying within big, uh, organizations become the people that will not be able to get funding unless they can conform to the ordinary. But the world hasn't been changed from conforming to the ordinary. It's about moving forward. As I earlier explained, 35 years after HIV and AIDS and we still have 13,000 deaths per year. I mean, how, how do you explain that? It's because we've been doing the very same thing and we have been operating within a Western paradigm uh, and colonial debris that is all over the place and we're failing to step out of it because we are not listening. So I think that that's one of the things that would be really helpful from institutions, organizations to actually give us a little bit of breathing space to, to explore and do something meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Sharifa. I think Sharifa, you said that beautifully. Even from my perspective over here. <laughs> Thank you. Was there anything you wanted to add, Filippo? Yes, it's just a question. Uh, it's from my point of view here in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, how do we reach the money, the financial institution, as a small fish or a collective of small fish? <laughs> we host <laughs> another webinar where we brainstorm this, this question. <laughs> 
it's um yeah I feel like I think Sharifa maybe said it before there are so many themes that came out of today that I think could form whole new webinars um for discussion which is great because I'm I'm pretty sure we have the enthusiasm um, and probably the right networks to be able to do that um so I think we might wrap up here it's already about 10 minutes over so thank you so much to everybody, um, especially those who stayed on as well and continued the discussion. Um, thank you so much to the speakers for your time and giving us some wonderful presentations. I think there's um, a lot of uh, comments in the in the chat thanking you as well for your wonderful presentations. Um, the YouTube channel link I posted in the chat. Um, so the this webinar and I believe the first one as well from um, this uh, this webinar series will be uploaded um, once they're ready. Um, so yes, thank you so much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll let you know about hopefully another one sometime soon. <laughs>